Hey, we begin with the last few words on Daf Mem Dal. The Gemara brings a Brisa. The Brisa says if a shar, an ox, had killed someone, and before he had a psak din on him, that is chayev misa, the owner went and either sold him, was maktish him, or shechted him, or if he was a shomer, returned him to his original owner. So all these four things are chal; they're all valid. The sale is valid, the hektish becomes valid hektish, the shechita works and the meat is now mutter to eat, and the shamer has returned it, and it's considered to be returned, and he no longer needs to pay for it going forward. If, however, the gemar din had already happened, so on the first three halachas, everyone agrees that the sale is not valid, the hektish is not chal, and the shechita is no good. The question is, if the shamer returns it, is it considered to be returned? That's a machlekes, Tanakama says no. It's not considered to be returned because you gave him something which is already usher bahana. It's already on its way out to be killed, and therefore you still owe him another shar. Rabbi Yaakov, however, says no, it is chal, it's considered to be valued, don't owe him going forward anymore. So the says, what is that machlekes about? The first wants to say the machlekes is, if you give someone, if you return his isra and that belongs to him, could you say that what I gave you what you gave me? It's the same thing. In between, when you gave it to me, when I returned it to you, it became usher bahana. That's not my problem. So if you just return it, the exact thing that it is, the fact that it became a valueless doesn't mean that it's not returned. That would be this uh, machlekes. According to the Rabbanon, um, that's what we would not say that. We would say he gave uh, you a shar which is worth money. You gave him back a shar which is valueless. It's not considered to be returned. You have to give him another one. But if Yaakov says no, you could just say, I, this is the shar you gave me. I gave it back to you. Now, Limar says, you want to say that that's what this Machlech is about. It's not true. It's not what this Machlech is about. Because if it was, they wouldn't argue in this case. They would argue in the case of Chametz on Pesach. If you borrow Chametz from someone and you return the Chametz on Pesach or after Pesach, and now it became Asr Bahano, does is it considered to be like you returned it or not? And that would fit this Machlech. But we don't have a Machlech between Rav Shemun and the Rabbanan in that case. On the contrary... They both agree in that case. The Lach is, you could say, you could return it. So what is this Machlekes about? So when it says that the Machlekes is about, could the basin give a Psak Din that the Shosh is Chaya Misa with the Shar not present? Does the Shar have to be there or not? Rav Yaakov holds that you can give a Psak even though the Shar is not there. The Rabbanon hold, the shar has to be there. Therefore, the original owner will say as follows, why didn't you give my shar to the Beisdin, to Paskinon? If you would have given it to me, I would have sent him off to the Agam. They never would have found him, and they couldn't give a psak on him. By you giving it to the Beisdin when there was another option, you were just mazik him, and therefore you owe me another shar. Now, the fact that he's also is not a problem. He, he could just return it, but he went and he was mazik in, and he didn't have to do that. Rav Yaakov says, no, the Bezim would have given him a psak anyway. It doesn't make a difference where he is, and therefore that's not a taina, and therefore he could he could say it, I returned it, Tarei Shechal Now, what is this machlek is over? So, Umar says, machlek is it, it says, Ashar Yisak of Agam Bailav Yimas, connecting the shar with its owners, then the two have the same halachas. So, the Rabbanon say, just like the person, a person, if you're going to pass it on him, has to be there. The shar, if you're going to pass it on him, he has to be there as well. And Yaakov says, no, that's a nonsensical comparison, because the owner, the person, if you're going to pass it on a person, you can't pass it if he's not there, because he may have a taina, he may have something to say. But the shar is not going to have anything to say, and therefore there's no point in having him there. The Gemara now refers back to our Mishnah, where we introduce the topic of the four shimrim and how they take responsibility for the ox and for the damages that happen. So let's first introduce the four Shemrim. You have the Shemr Chinam, the Shoyal, the Nesizchar, and the Seicher, and they have different halacha. So the Nesizchar and the Seicher, the renter and the one who's paid to watch, they have the same halacha for the most part. They each receive something in that situation, both the Shemr and the owner the Bailam each receive something, and therefore they're responsible to take the place of the owner and watch as he should have watched in a full-fledged Shmir Ma'ula. Oshayel is responsible much beyond that. He's the only one who gets anything out of it. He's enjoying the usage of it for free, and therefore he's responsible for everything, ex- including an Inus. Hashem Rechinam has the least responsibility. He's watching for free. He gets nothing out of the deal. He's just doing a favor for the owner, and therefore all he has to do to be putter is to make sure he's not pushaya. He can't be negligent. He doesn't have to do uh, a full level as the owner would do. So the Gemara begins by quoting Brisa, 
that says that the four Shemrim take the place of the original owner, Shemrim, Shoyal, Nesizchar, and Nesaychar. However, the lachas are as follows. If the animal kills as a tam, then it is killed, but it's putter, these four are putter from paying kaifer. If it's a muad, then they pay kaifer, and they have to return the full ox to the owner, except for Hashem Echidim. Hashem Echidim is different. It doesn't have to return another ox to the owner. Someone asks, what's the pshat? If they did a shmira, so then they should all be putter. If they did not do a shmira, they should all be chayv. So my answer is talking about where he did a shmira prusa. He did a minor watching. He did a very minimal uh, watching. For a shemir chinam, that's all he has to do. And therefore, he's potter by doing that. For the other ones, they were responsible to do a more practical, in-depth shmira, and therefore, they are still chayv. Now, the Gemara asks, hold on a second, there's a Mishnah coming up soon in a few lines that gives three opinions as to how much you have to do a shmira. And the problem is that the two main opinions don't seem to fit with either of these. So the first opinion there that the Gemara considers is that of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir holds that a muad has to have a shmira muad, have to do a real shmira. So that would make sense here because we're saying that for the other shamer besides for shamer chinam they're chayav because they didn't do a shmir meula. The problem is that Rabbi Huda holds that a seicher doesn't have the halacha of a shamer sachar. Seicher has the halacha of a shamer chinam. If that's true, then we should say not only is the shamer chinam a potter, but the seicher is potter as well. And therefore, this couldn't be Rabbi Meir. And if it's Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Huda says that a seicher has the halacha of a shamer sachar which is fine, and that works out, that he wouldn't be listed together with the Shemachinim here. But the problem is that he holds that all Mu'adin are chayim only a Shmir Prusa, as we shall see soon. And therefore, you shouldn't have to be kaifer at all, because the Mu'ad, if there was a Shmir Prusa, uh, the, that's enough. And for all of them, there's no reason that they should do anything else. We just said that the case is that they did a Shmir Prusa. It should be a Pator for everybody. So therefore, this mission doesn't fit with either of them. So the Gemara says this mission is the third opinion there, which is Rabbi Lazar, who says that the only shmir that's enough is to actually shech the cow. Otherwise, there's no shmir that's going to potter you. Except, of course, for Hashem Rechinam. And therefore, he would say that everyone besides Hashem Rechinam here is chayev. As far as the nice schar, as far as Hashem Rechinam, he, he holds, as far as the seicher, that is, he holds that he's like Hashem Rechinam and not like Hashem Rechinam, and therefore, it fits with him as well. That is the Gemara's first answer that is brought by Rav Huna Bar Chinina. And then Gemara quotes Abai. This is a different answer. This is really Rabbi Meir. And you will switch the opinions like Rabbi Bar said that uh, the Seicher is like a Shemer Sacher according to Rabbi Meir. And according to Rabbi Huda is the one who says that it's like a Shemer Chinam. Gemara now quotes another halacha brought by Rabbi Elazar. This one, Rabbi Elazar says, if somebody gives a shar over to a shemachinim and he damages the shemachinim, is chayev. If he gets damaged, the shemachinim is potter. Rabbi says, why? If he was makabel to take care of nazikin, then he should be chayev either way. If he was not makabel, he should be potter either way. So Gemara answers, we're talking about where he was in mood. Rabbi says, he was makabel to take care of nazikin, and it was a mood, or with, at least it was a nagchan, it was a violent animal. So when a person accepts to guard an animal like that, he assumes he's going to be worried about what the things that that animal usually needs to do, things that usually happen to the animal, which is that he attacks others. Well, that's what he had in mind, that he would get attacked. He never uh, thought about that, and therefore he's not high for it. Okay, now we begin the Mishnah that was mentioned earlier. Three opinions as to when you are chayiv for a shor. So it's uh, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Huda, and Rabbi Lazar. So he realizes most machmer, he says, even if you do a high-level shmir, a shmir ma'ula, you're still chayev for any hezek that he causes. And the way he phrases that is, in the lasak, and the only thing which will get you out of having to pay for it is if you actually kill him, because then he won't do anything. But otherwise, you chayev for everything. Now, Rabbi Huda says that you only have to do, that there's a difference between a tam and a muad. So he says, for a tam, you have to do a shmira mu'ula, a high level shmir. For a mu'ud, you actually only have to do a shmira pchusa, a low level shmir. You'd be potter if you do. The reason is because when the Torah describes a mu'ud, it says, velo yushmirin ubal, yuchayev, if you didn't watch it. That means if you did anything, you're potter. And Rabbi Meir says, whether it's a tam or a mu'ud, you have to do a shmira 
Meula. And therefore, if he did a Shmira Meula, you would be Potter on any Hezek that happened, again, whether it's a Tam or a Mood. If you only did a Shmira Pusa, however, which is Mishra gives two examples, tied it with a rope, or you locked it behind a door that can withstand a normal wind, that's Shmira Pachusa. If you did those two things, Mishra says you're Chayev, because both a Tam and a Mood, you have to do a Shmira Meula in order to be Potter. Okay, the Gemara begins, the Gemara explains what the three opinions are based upon. So Rabbi Meir, who says, Yechayef do a shmir me'ula, learns as follows. Generally, a person does not do any shmir at all. He just leaves an ox alone. The Torah says, you have to do a shmir. It says that if you don't, you be chayef or a tam. And therefore, it's saying you have to do at least a shmir p'chusa. Then it discusses a mood, and it says, which means you have to do an even higher level. You have to do a shmir me'ula. That says by a mood. Now, you learn from Shmira Meula, you learn Shmira Meula from a mood to a time, because both of them it says Negicha, and if you learn Begzei Rishava, you have to do a Shmira Meula by both of them. Now, what's Rabbi Yehuda's opinion? So Rabbi Yehuda says, generally, a person watches his shor with a Shmira Pechusa. On that shor, is watched with a Shmira Pechusa, who's a time, the Torah says, you need to pay, if it has a cap. So you see your Chai for a Shmira Pechusa on a time, you have to do a Shmira Meula. Then it goes on to talk about a mood. And it says about Hashmir Meula, it says, Lo Yishmirenu, he didn't watch it, about the Mood. It implies you have to do even a more Shmir Meula. So that's what's called a Riboy Acher Ariboy. Generalization after a generalization, which we learn as a Miet, the Torah is limiting that the Shmir Meula is only by the Tom. You don't have to do a Shmir Meula by the Mood. Now, if you say that there is a Gzei Roshava and a Gicha and a Gicha, like Rabbi Meir said, so you ask, you should learn from one to the other. So there's a Meir that says, V'lo Yishmerenu. It's only about this one that you don't watch it, but not about the Mu'ad. The V'lo Yishmerenu L'zev L'acher, only about this one, can you get away with Ishmer Pchusa? But for a Tam, you can't get away with Ishmer Pchusa. So Mar says, which means it's not extra, you need that v'lo yishmerenu to teach me the halacha that you said, the riboy achar, riboy that you said. So Mar says, no, that will be enough to say v'lo yishmer. Yishmerenu is extra, and that's to limit it. The Gemara now quotes a b'risa that brings a fourth opinion, Rabbi Lezim and Yaakov, who says, both a tam and a mood, if you did a shmer b'chusa, you putter. So where does he hold? So he holds like a behuda who says that a mood is enough to have a shmer b'chusa, and he does learn the gzir shav and a gicha and a gicha, that, that applies by a tam as well. Now, another halacha, the Marcos of Adabar Ava, who says that Rabbi Yehuda only said that the putter, the p'tur of a shmira p'chusa on a mu'ad, is only on the tzad ha'ada. That is the money we added on when he became a mu'ad, the second half of the chasi nezek. The, the completion of the nezek, of the chasi nezek to the nezek shalim. However, the original tzad tamos became a menace. The mu'ad is paying 50% still as a tam, and therefore on that tam payment, tam halach will still apply, and you would be chay for shmir p'chusa, you would need to do a shmir me'ula. Umar now quotes Rav, who's going to end up arguing on Avadah Barava. So Rav says a cryptic thing. He says that an animal which is moved to gore with its right horn is not become a moved to gore with its left horn. So the Gemara assumes that that can't be teaching me what it sounds like simply. It can't be teaching me that if he always gores with his right horn, then he doesn't have to pay Nezik Shalim if he gores with his left horn, because that's obvious that we've seen that halacha many times, that the specific thing that Ashar is moved for, he's moved for, it doesn't expand to other things. So what is he teaching me? So he must be teaching me, the Gemara assumes, as far as how much Shmir you have to do. So then the Gemara says, okay, so then what Shita is he holding like? He can't be holding like Rabbi Meir, because according to Rabbi Meir, it makes no difference if he's a Tam or if he's a Mu'ad. It's the same, either way you have to do a Shmir Ma'ula. So it must be Rabbi Huda's opinion that there's a different shmir for the left horn and different shmir for the right horn in this particular situation. So Mara asks, and if that's true, then we just had a Vadab who says you only have to pay half the Nezek anyway if you did a shmira uh, Pusa, because the Tzad Tamos you pay Yechai for shmira Pusa, and the Tzad Mu'ud, you put the first mir p'chusa. So anyway, you're only going to pay half of it. So what's Rav adding here? So our answer is that Rav is adding that he doesn't hold like Avad Barava, and he holds that there is no split between Sad Tamos and Sad Moedas, and therefore you would have to pay fully 
in a situation where the animal was fully a tam or a muad. It's only in this case where one horn is tam and one horn is muad. That's where you have a difference, and you could say that half of the payment is tamos and half the payment is muedas.